Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. This is Multifamily Chronicles, and I am your host, Adrian Danila. Today, we have as a guest, a very special guest. It's uh, Joe Bailey. Joe Bailey is the Chief Executive Officer with Swift Bunny. Welcome to the show, Joe. Thanks for having me, Adrian. I appreciate you being, appreciate being here. Joe, uh, I wanted to start by introducing yourself uh, to the audience for you know, very few people that don't know who you are. You know, you've been around for a very long time and you've done some amazing things in the industry. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, well, I've been, in multi, I've been in real estate management now for about 42 years and I started out in the resort hotel business, went from there to commercial uh, and then finally into multifamily. So I've worked, had the opportunity to work on both the management side of multifamily as well as the vendor side of multifamily. Uh, on, the, on the management side, my biggest career move was with Maryland and Investment Company. We were one of the original four apartment REITs out there in the country and uh, started with them, spent about 12 years with them and helped grow their portfolio from about 1,500 units to 35,000. So that was a heck of an experience for us. And, and that was back in the uh, late 80s, the early 90s, when the RTC was throw, you know, was selling stuff at pennies on the dollar and Wall Street was throwing capital at multifamily. And we just, we had a heck of a growth spurt. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. And then in 1998, uh, uh, the company was sold to Equity Residential. And uh, I was playing golf and enjoying myself for about two months. And my wife told me I needed to get back out and get a job. <laughs> So we uh, we started a little company called Graysill Incorporated, graysill.com. And uh, we were uh, we weren't on the le leading edge. We were on the bleeding edge, basically, of trying to, to introduce online and web based training to the multifamily industry. That was a heck of a thing, because back then, very few folks were actually using the Internet for this type of a stuff, this type of a venture. And uh, a lot of folks we talked to loved the product, but they couldn't access it because they didn't have access to the net. And so we went through a lot of years of tough years of trying to get that thing up and running and really get it, get uh, accepted by the industry. We finally did and, uh, and ran it pretty successfully for about 17 years. And then, uh, in 2014, we sold, uh, we finally decided to sell it and I was planning on retiring, which I was able to do for three years. And then one of my original partners and friends from, um, from actually all the way back to Maryland was Kara Rice. She, uh, she called me up and said, uh, are you done? And I said, what do you mean? Am I done? <laughs> she says, says, do you want to just sit on your butt for the rest of your life? Or do you want to go back to work? And I said, I think I'd like to go back to work. And I said, what'd you have in mind? And so we started this company Swift Bunny in 2018. And it's been a, it's been a heck of a ride for us because we were ready to launch our products and services in February of 2020, which has Probably all your viewers remember that was not a great time to trying to be launch a company. <laughs> Most companies were getting shut down at the time. So I've been with Swift Bunny now, uh, going on, uh, well, I guess, five years now, and it's been a lot of fun. We're uh, really starting to gain, gain some traction, and things are things get pretty exciting. Excellent. Uh, Joe, I want to go back a little bit to the uh, Grace Hill story, because uh, as everybody knows, mm -hmm. Grace Hill, it's probably the, the leading uh, educational platform in an industry, and it has been for years even before you uh, you sold the company. So first of all, I'm curious, wh where is the name Grace Hill coming from? I always wonder, <laughs> why Grace Hill? Yeah, we, uh, it's really funny. We, when we were in a trade show booth, people would come up to us and say, they wouldn't say, they wouldn't ask us about it. They'd just say, who is Grace Hill? They thought it was a person. And mm -hmm. uh, we, we got that question asked of us so many times. Um, and uh, the truth of the matter is, is that Grace Hill is the name of a small town that's located in County Antrim in Northern Ireland, where my family's from, and uh, my my dad's side of the family actually. And uh, it's it's funny because we, when we when we created the company, we had Grace Hill as two words, Grace Hill, two separate words. And the name of the town, I didn't realize this at the time, but the name of the town is actually one word, Grace Hill, all all, to, all run together. So that's that's where the name came from. We had. Uh, I had, my family had uh, 13 brothers and sisters that came over in 1825 from County Antrim in Grace Hill. And so we've got a lot of Baileys in the Southeast down here and in Charleston areas. <laughs> that, that's the name. There's, there's nothing else to it. 
if I remember, if I remember exactly back in like two, 2004, 2005, the website had a lot of green in it. And I think I saw yeah. some Sharma Rocks too. It, it, yeah, it am, did. I, am I wrong remembering that? No, no, you're, you're, you're very right in remembering that. And we had, uh, we had kind of a Gaelic look to the name, the way it was, the way it was, the logo was designed. And it had a, uh, shamrock over the eye has the dot on the eye and it was just kind of a nod to my heritage and um that was you know they, they've changed the logo since then it's not there anymore but it uh it was a lot of fun for a lot of years we enjoyed it that's excellent uh that, that that's an amazing story uh <clears throat> so joe if you were to look back from when you started a company and how the company evolved uh what would you say was your vision? What what did you want it to become, and what what did it end up becoming under your uh, under your leadership? That's a Adrian. That's a great question. It's an interesting answer to it. To uh, originally when we started Graysell, the reason I started Graysell was because when I'd been in on the management side, it was always frustrating to me about the fact of how reticent some people were to share marketing information where. You, know, you, you want to find out what's going on in the marketplace, what specials were being offered, what 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 rates, what market rates were being offered on a two bedroom or a three bedroom, what have you. And then you, know, you call around to your competitors, and a lot of times they didn't want to tell you anything. Uh, they, they were it was very it was very tough to get any information. And so it, when we started Grace Hill, the original idea behind Grace Hill had nothing to do with e-learning. It actually we wanted to create a uh, we wanted to create an environment where people could could anonymously share as much information as they wanted about anything. Uh, forums, letters, talk about market stats, this, that, the other. I mean, just just create a really open forum where folks could could uh, share information and ideas. And, you know, I could ask questions. What works for you when this happened? And somebody could say, well, we tried that. We tried this and that didn't work and this did work, et cetera. So we really wanted it to be an open platform. And we were we were cruising along and we weren't making a lot of money. We weren't doing that well you know, business wise. And believe it or not, my father, who was an educator, he was a uh, he was a professor of medicine for uh, sixty years. And he came to me one day. We were talking about this. He said, "Joe, he says, you know something? The success of Grace Hill is going to come off of education." And he, and my dad couldn't bear, could barely turn on a computer. <laughs> and here he was telling me exactly what was going to work for us. And uh, so we we started investigating that we found a company up in greenville south carolina we were based in augusta georgia about two hours away and uh we went up there and talked with these guys and they were all into e-learning they had worked on e-learning for big businesses and big industries around the country and said we can do the same for you we'd help you out with this so we started learning the things that we needed to learn to to really create a program that would make sense so we went from being this open information sharing platform to being a, uh, a, a basically an e-learning e company purely almost um, and uh, it worked it absolutely worked and I, you know I, I'll tell you a, a quick story um, Adrian we had a, a forum section on Graysill back in the day and it was where people could post forms like like pet addendums and leases and all kind of things that they use day in day out check you know move in forms what have you and uh, you could download them for free. didn't cost you a dime. And you could make copies and use them throughout your organization. Well, that was way, I mean, that was 20 years ago. So my son has gotten a job as a leasing agent in South Florida. He started recently and he was going over the forms that they had in the, uh, in the book there in the office. And he looked up in the top left corner of one of these forms and there was the old Gray Hill logo up in the top left. <laughs> So they're still using them out there. Some people are, and it was it was amazing. That he, he called me and told me about that. That just tickled me pink. Well, this says a lot about the legacy that you created, Joe, with this project, and it's it's an amazing story to share. Uh, I think a lot of times we just kind of underestimate the impact that we have on the world until a story like this happens. It's, it's just that because m most stories like this are being untold, they remain untold. People find they don't say anything about it. For you, luckily, it was your son that saw the logo and just passed on the, the story to you, which is, it's extraordinary. <laughs> like 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, things things don't last nowadays in a, a, a tech year. <laughs> I don't last six months. And you're talking about a form that lasted 
was passed on by you know uh, generations really because you're talking yeah. about generations when we're when we're thinking about turnover rate in the industry do you imagine how many managers went over and they pass on that form you know there were mm -hmm. probably 30 40 50 managers in 20 years probably and, probably. And pro probably hundreds of leasing consultants for sure in the same place and the form yep. still is still there today so that that's that's truly amazing and it speaks volumes about the impact that you know you had at the time with the project and you know still still do you know still do i mean that's mm -hmm. that's that's such an amazing story <clears throat> so joe next i wanted to ask you about being a being a founder a company founder a successful one uh, that mm -hmm. and a an executive uh, a, a lot of folks you know moving up in the industry whether they're on a management side whether on a uh, on a vendor partner side they want to become more some of them actually have the dream to become executives so from your experience what are some things that you you would like to share with people that have the goal to reach all the way up to the top what are some things to look for what are some things that help you throughout your career to become mm -hmm. as successful hugely successful as you are well you, i've had some some help along the way obviously you, you don't get you don't get to be an executive you don't get to own a company or run a company without a lot of help along the way um, i've had some mentors that absolutely were priceless to me um, probably one of the, the greatest business people i've ever met was a guy named peter knox Peter was the uh, founder of uh, Maryland Investment Company. Um, great guy. He, he really knew how to run the company. He understood the business, but most importantly, he understood the people that he had hired, you know, to work for him. And you know, he had a he had a saying that I thought was was really impressive to me. He says, "If you want to be successful, he said, find the best possible people you can find to fill the positions in your company." to do the various things that need to be done. He says, train those folks, give them all the support and technology, whatever they need to do the job. And then for God's sakes, get the hell out of the way and let them do it. That's what he said. And it, it's, it's, uh, I've heard other people say that over the years, but he was the first person that ever said that to me. And they really made an impression on me because that's exactly the way he ran his company. And uh, he was extremely successful with what he did. And, you know, the, the great thing was that people really liked him. Um, they, they, they wanted to work for him. They wanted, because he was willing to do whatever he had to do for them so that they could do their jobs. They wanted to work for these companies. They were committed to, to, to working for him. And that was a, that was a great lesson for me is if you hire great people, you know, you, you got to support them. You've got to do whatever you can do to make their lives such that they can come to work every day and feel enthusiastic about what they're doing. You want them to committed to, to the company. You want them committed to whatever it is, whatever path you're trying to go down. And, you know, obstacle life throws obstacles at all of us all the time. And as an executive, you've got the, the power and the privilege to be able to help those people overcome those obstacles and problems that come their way. And if you do a good job of that, it's amazing what can happen. It really is. That That's, uh, that's very powerful wisdom, Joe, right there. Find the best people. Give them everything that they need, tools, uh, and training. Train them well, and get out of the way. Let them do what mm -hmm. they, what they do best, what they're best at. Um, I'm a firm believer in those principles myself. Uh, I'm actually surprised that it's actually not the norm. Uh, in my experience in the industry, it's kind of yeah. the, the other way around. When examples of just having this type of leadership makes such a huge impact and it really makes mm -hmm. people feel like they belong to something uh you get this buy-in to your plans and dreams uh and if you don't get the buy-in how you know how, how are you going to get people to really work hard for you uh, i'm hearing right. often i'm hearing often uh that managers are looking for someone with ownership mentality so when you expect for an employee to come bring to the table an ownership mentality, but you don't give them any type of ownership. And it doesn't have to be a monetary incentive. You, you don't have to make them part of the ownership of the company, but make them part of the ownership of the ideas they're implemented, of their plans. I think that's a great beginning, a great start right there to just 
bring them in and get them to contribute, listen to them. Uh, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get uh, hopefully later on to, uh, to uh, discuss some uh, some of those uh, so, some of those uh, issues, but I, I think it's very very important. Uh, I like to take uh, to get your take on it. You know what is what is that is so powerful about you know getting this buy in and this ownership thing. You know how do we mm -hmm. make people feeling part of you know owning the the company? Yeah, I, we've done this over the years. We I always tried to when we were trying to come up with new ideas or change our product or make it better or what have you. And it's easy to sit down with a small group and discuss it, but. What we'd like to do is bring as many opinions in as we could. And we, we actually listen, we listen to these opinions. The worst thing you can do is, as an owner or as an executive or a management person is, is to ask an opinion from somebody, have them give you that opinion, and then just kind of ignore it. Stick it in the drawer and call it a day. And that, that's what happens so often. You know, with Swift Bunny, one of the things we do at Swift Bunny is we, we survey people about what's going on. And one of the key things we tell executives and clients is, don't survey somebody and then just look at the survey and then put it in a folder and stick it in a file somewhere and, and not pay attention to it. That That is the worst possible thing you can do. If you want to ask folks their opinion about something, get their buy-in to it or their input on it, you want their opinion about it, fine, do that, but then then act on that. You know, Communicate back to that person. When you say, what, when I say, Adrian, what do you think of this idea? And then you tell me, you know, and then I just hang the phone up you're expecting some kind of feedback from me to say, Hey, Adrian, that's a great idea. Or Adrian, that's, there's no way in heck that's going to work because of blank. But, but you want, you want some feedback from me about what you just said. And if I give you that feedback, that makes a big difference. If I don't, it's a real problem. I, uh, I couldn't agree more, Joe. Um, and this brings me to, to my next question. You know, you're currently leading Swift Bonnie, uh, another success, very successful company that you have founded. Uh, I, I wanna, uh, I wanted to ask you to share with us, with the audience right here. Uh, what are some great things that are happening at Sweet, Sweet Bunny? What type of uh, services your company is uh, is offering, sure. and how, how how do they, you know, how do they help the industry? Well, we're trying to create and working on creating a, a suite of products that help you manage your people to help you manage the folks who work in your company as an executive or an executive team or a C-suite team. What we want to do is create things that you can use to understand the opinions and the problems and issues that your, your employees have and how to rectify those and make them better. There, there's basically four major components that we have right now to what we're offering at Swift Bunny. We have a product called Engage, which is able to measure the employee engagement within your organization on an ongoing basis throughout the course of the year. And so we, we, we turn around, turn the data from that around to you and show you what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. And then we take it a few steps beyond that, because we don't want to just say this is right and this is wrong. We want to say, here's how you can solve and make these things that are issues better. You can resolve these issues. And so we give you ways to go after and attack these problems within your organization and then give you ways to track whether you know, it, what you're doing is actually working or not. So it's not just a survey. It takes you all the way through to resolving the issues the survey identifies, and it gives you a way to make sure that at the end of the day, they were in fact resolved. So that's one thing we're doing. We're doing a custom survey solution, which allows you to ask your own questions. The engage solution is one that allows you to benchmark yourself against the entire rest of the industry when it comes to employee engagement. And then the last two we've got, we've got a resident satisfaction survey product, which we believe is a great way. A lot, a lot of folks use resident satisfaction surveys to Adrian to just boost their ratings on Yelp, on, online, on Google, what have you. And we, we like to use them as an indicator of just how to get a, how good a job and how engaged and focused people on site are in terms of what they're doing day in, day out. So we have a product that's, that's really focused on making that happen. And then last but not least, the product that we're launching this fall is called Introduce, which is a way an onboarding product. It allows you to onboard your employees in a very trackable, easy to, easy to work way. And as an industry right now, when it comes to onboarding, we do a terrible job of onboarding. I mean, that's just, it's a fact. And uh, half of the people that you will lose at your company, you will lose within the first six months or the first 90 days 
uh, of having them as an employee. So making sure that you do a great job on onboarding the employee is key. If you do a good job there, then you stand a much better chance of keeping that employee long term. And as you know, from the statistics that are out there right now, the uh, trying to find an employee to fill an open position is tough. It's gotten real tough. Now, Joe, I want to stop at the, uh, the onboarding part because it's one of the things that I'm passionate about. And I don't disagree with you at all. We are doing a terrible job as an industry. Like There's so much room for improvement. Uh, yep. I, I'm going to take an example of a new maintenance technician coming on board <laughs> the okay. first day. So they're, they're showing up, you know, good morning, good morning. Probably mo most of the coworkers don't even know who the person is. May the supervisor probably knows and the property manager. They don't even get introduced. They're waiting around looking for someone to ask them, hey, you know, what's your business right here? The, the fi that finally happens. And then the manager comes and grabs them into the office. Hey, come in. We got to do the new hire paperwork. And let's do this really fast because we have some work to do. So they're, they're, they're pushing the guy through the, you know, filling out the paperwork. <laughs> you know, have you finished yeah. it? Have you finished it? You know, how, how much more? So, you know, finally, you get them through the process. Everything's done so you can submit to HR. And the next thing you know, it's like, great, you're here. Here's the keys. And here's like a stack of 100 work orders. We're so far behind. See if yeah. you could get like at least 50 done today. Have, have a great day. So that's kind of the, it, it is the typical scenario of, oh, what managers, I think, you know, fail to realize is that there's there's a stress to begin with when you start a new job. You don't know the place well enough. You don't know the people well enough. You don't know the environment. You don't know your residents. Probably you don't know the company well enough. So there's just so much for you that you don't know. And on top of that, they're coming and they're just literally dumping all this work on you, and they expect you to to perform some magic on mm -hmm. your first day. Uh, so <laughs> that's that's really the typical way of you know right. awarding uh, ma maintenance personnel. Uh, so with that being said, Joe, I I'd like for you to share some tips, right? Some things that you know and you learned that you know could work to do things differently, and just for us right. to do a better job at onboarding. Yeah, the, the, several things that come to mind. W one of the most important things is that prior to the employee getting there for their first day. You, they need to understand what it is that's about to happen. You're going to come in on this day. We need you here at this time in the morning. And your first week, we're going to do this, 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 this in this order. Um, and there's so many other things to do other than just to fill out new hire paperwork. I mean, you, you've got things like, for example, uh, do they need an employee uh, company email address? Do they need login credentials for the property management software that, that's being used or the maintenance software that's being used? Um, do they need a uniform? Do they need a name badge? Do they need business cards? I mean, there's all these things you go down the list. There's a ton of things that need to be done. Some of these things can be done prior to them ever showing up for their first day. There's no reason if, if you know their name and, and, and you know what the standard company policy is regarding how to do email addresses. Maybe it's your first name at abcmanagement.com. Maybe it's Jay Bailey at ABC Management, you know, whatever it is. But you, you could submit that to your IT department and go ahead and set that up well in advance of them showing up for their first day. The point is, is that people don't do that. They, they don't take the time to prep beforehand. Um, your staff, your existing staff needs to understand, hey, we just hired Joe Bailey as a new maintenance tech. He'll be starting next Monday on at such and such a time. And, and oh, by the way, Fred, I want you to mentor Joe when he gets here. I want you to be his mentor the first week or the first two weeks or whatever. Um, so there's all these things that can be done in beforehand, but we're so busy. We're so shorthanded out there right now. People are running like, like rats on a, on a, on a wheel. It, it's just unbelievable how much over overwork we've got. It's not surprising that things fall between the cracks, more, maybe even more so than they did before. But these are the things that need to be done. And, and even if it's tough, even if there's a, you know, there's a lot of folks that, uh, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of other vacancies maybe at your property. You still got to take the time to do this. When you lose an employee, the cost of losing an employee is huge. It's off the charts. And the longer that position remains unfilled, the, the more expensive it is to your company in terms of the cost. So at the end of the day, taking the time to do the prep work, whatever it takes, you, you got to do it. If, if you don't, you, your, your chances of losing that employee 
pretty soon after hiring that person are go get pretty high. So prep work is a key thing. Preparation is the name of the game. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, you uh, you did say is that the the cost of you know the the cost associated with losing employees and this could this could turn out to be a lot right why can't we just why can't we just do some great work to begin with prep work like you said and avoid that you know make them feel mm -hmm. and it's not just for the new hires I, I think it's more so for the new hires because there are more stressors for them to deal with the right. unknown the unknowns that I just mentioned prior right company new people so on and so forth but it's also for the existing staff when you're sure staff and probably 95 percent of you know places out there uh, especially property level are uh when you're sure staff don't treat your don't make your employees feel like you're punishing them for being sure mm -hmm. staff it's not their fault that the property is sure staff therefore when you keep adding more and more work to them just because there's not enough people to properly do the work to have a proper workload what you're mm -hmm. actually doing you make them feel like they're getting punished for being around and that is not a good mental situation not even physical situation to be in because they you know they end up working 50 60 hours a week in mm -hmm. 100 plus degrees uh, heat out there and that makes them break man like I, I'm hearing stories all the time, like real life stories, and they're heartbreaking. We can't keep doing yep. that to our people. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100. percent You know, one of the easy things to do uh, that any any manager on site can do, any maintenance supervisor can do. So, you know, if if you when you're talking to the employees, if you empathize with the fact that you understand that they're overloaded you understand that they're working their tails off to get stuff done in 100 100 degree heat what have you it, just just the fact that you recognize that and that you shared that with them that hey listen you're not alone in this i feel the same way and, and so do the rest of the team here having time to talk to each other about this stuff is a big deal uh during a monday meeting say most you know most properties when i ran a property i would sit there on monday mornings have my staff together we'd have coffee and talk about the week to come and what's going on but sharing information about how people are feeling about what's going on, about the stress that they're, they're, they're enduring right now. You know, it, we've got four things that, that are major factors right now that, that Swift Bunny's determined from all the surveys we've done about the things that are really major issues for folks on site right now. And, and there are four recurring themes that we, t that we see no matter what company we're surveying, you know, no matter where it is in the country. But one of those things, is the stress levels on site and the workloads being more than they're used to because so and so they got a vacancy here and a vacancy there that the workloads are a real real issue and it's a big factor in why people walk why they leave and go somewhere else so you know just recognizing the fact that there's issues that there's stress that there's there's too much work to be done and not enough people to do it that alone is is a plus and can help you know at least make folks realize that the company cares that we're not just here we're experiencing the same things you are and we care about you yeah that that's that, that makes a tremendous difference <clears throat> for sure <clears throat> the next uh, question that i have uh joe i want to uh, get your take on uh i, I read about a 20 uh, 20 report from uh gallup that indicates that 40 percent of the u.s employees are engaged you know enthusiastic contributing uh and committed to their work and the rest of them are either like, uh, you know, in between, we're just showing up here, or they're downright, downright miserable at mm -hmm. their jobs. You know, 60%. That's very concerning. You know, it should yep. be very concerning. So <clears throat> with this uh, being said, what are some things that you see from your surveys, you know, from uh, employees being surveyed at various companies uh, across the right. country? And what are some solutions that you're proposing to your uh to your clients when it comes to this type of uh, lack of engagement? Well, I'll, I'll go just go back to these four factors that I just mentioned a second ago. Uh, the, the four reasons why, why people are having issues out there right now. These are the things that are the highest issues of all the issues we look at. We look at a lot of them, but Adrian, these are the four that, that sit at the top of the list. Um, I want to talk about the most obvious one first, and that's compensation. 
And when I say compensation, I don't just mean wages. I mean the entire package, your benefits, your paid time off, uh, any type of profit sharing or employee stock option plans, insurance, all of this. When you put all this stuff together as a package, if you're an operator out there right now and you haven't looked at your your compensation package within the past six months or so and, and made some revisions to it, you're probably running behind when it comes to trying to hire good people. Compensation is going up. It is, there's no question about it right now. It is an employee's market, not an employer's market. Um, the latest numbers I've got is just to define that a little bit further is at the end of the second quarter of this year, 2022, we had 10.7 million vacant positions in this country. Now that includes not just multifamily, that's everything. Um, and normally in, in a normal year, and by normal, I mean, I guess pre-pandemic, go back a few years. Normally there's roughly about the same number of people looking for jobs as there are jobs. I mean, it, it could be slightly up or slightly down either way, but, but it, they're roughly the same. Right now, in terms of people actively seeking jobs in this country, there's 5.9 million people looking for a job. And they've looked for a job within the past 12 months and looked for a job within the past four weeks of the time the survey was taken. So think about that in a minute. Just round the numbers off. There are 11 million vacant jobs, and we've got 6 million people looking. That means that roughly for every two jobs out there, there's one person that's looking for a job. In addition to that, we had 1.5 million what are called marginally attached uh, individuals. And what, what we mean by that is that they have looked for a job within the past year, but not within the past month of the time the survey was taken. Out of that 1.5 million, 424,000, and this, is, this all comes from the Department of Labor, by the way, but 424,000 are what are called discouraged workers. They have not looked for a job within the past year. So we have this huge amount of folks out there that, that are that have left the workforce, basically abandoned, abandoned looking for a job. And so now we have all these vacant job openings and we only have a fraction of the number of people, you know, that can fill those jobs or they're looking for jobs. So compensation becomes key because if they don't like what you're offering, if I walk in your office and you, uh, you tell me what your offer is and Adrian, it's not good enough. I'm going to go down the street. I, I've got 14 other companies I can go talk to restaurants, hotels, you name it. I mean, doesn't have to be multifamily. I can I can be a maintenance tech in multifamily, and believe you me, I can get a job in a lot of different places. So compensation, making sure that the compensation package your company offers is key. It's really important to make sure you're up to date and the salaries and benefits, especially that you offer, are are uh, are competitive, not just with the other multifamily operators down the street, but the other companies around town. Uh, so that's that's one big thing. Um, second thing we've got that was a huge factor on this list. The second one is is understanding a career path, understanding what my future is. So if I come to work for you at your company, I need to I need to have a clear understanding of how I can progress in the company. What what's my potential? How do I become? If I'm starting out as a maintenance tech, how do I become a manager? How do I become a maintenance supervisor? How do I become a regional manager? How can I work my way up the path? And a lot of companies just don't. Um, don't talk about that enough. They don't market that enough. And one real simple solution to that, one super simple solution to that is market your, your openings, your job openings. When you have a vacancy, market them internally first and make sure that your, your, your people understand that you're not talking to the rest of the world about this job opening just yet. I'm talking to you guys first. I'm giving y'all first shot at this. That, that makes them that makes the employees understand that, in a sense, that you've got their back. You're going to give them those opportunities first before going to anybody else in the world. Uh, we talked about stress a minute ago. Um, I think, you know, right now, there's, there's not a ton you can do about it except to recognize it and, and talk with people about it. Offer, you know, offer free. If people want to go to counseling, offer free counseling get together with somebody locally, a psychologist that can sit down or a group that can sit down and talk to your folks if they want to, either individually or in groups. You know, we just, with the NAA, we just uh, uh, ran, did two mental health surveys for the industry, one last fall and then the other this past spring, right before NAA. And the stress levels are through the roof out there. There's no question about it. The survey results show us that. And so at the end of the day, it becomes really, really important 
that anything you can do to just recognize the stress will make a big difference. But if you can help them with that through counseling or something like that, there's no shame in that. And it's just something that the industry needs to, to, they need to make that statement. What I just said, they need to say, there's no shame in feeling stress and, and telling the world that you're stressed. We all are. And there's, we're going to offer you services and ways to help you resolve some of that stress. So that's that. The last, the last thing is the onboarding. Um, and it's like you said a minute ago, you said it so well, you said you got to get organized. You got to have this stuff nailed down and, and organized. And we're, we're just not, whether you use Swift Money to help you with the onboarding or, or do better checklists or what have you out there, whatever it takes, you need to do a better job of it. Because if you don't onboard properly, you're going to lose that employee. And one last thing just to mention, Adrian, is the cost of, of turnover of an employee is pretty high, but there's some things that go along with that that, that, that come from that that are even higher. Uh, residents look at the leasing office, and if they see a revolving door in the leasing office, they're more likely to leave themselves. So employee turnover directly impacts resident turnover is a fact. And the cost of resident turnover is even higher than the cost of employee turnover. So the two are definitely linked. They're related. And you want to make sure that, uh, that you do a good job with the onboarding because if you lose that employee, the total cost of what it's going to impact you with is, is huge. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more uh, on every single point that you made. <clears throat> so I want to touch on the first one that you mentioned, compensation and the whole package, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the conversation that I'm hearing more, more most often in the industry is this. We are paying competitive wages and people don't want to work. Like this is the statement that I'm hearing most from higher managers. So I can't help myself but to ask a follow-up question. How do you define competitive? And the answer most of the times is that we're paying just about the same as our competition pace, or maybe a little over that. So then I ask, don't you realize that they have the same problems? They're not solving them problems. So you're taking a, a, a failing model, a model that's not too successful, you're copying it, you're uh, replicating it, and you're expecting a different result. Mm -hmm. I, I'm literally just telling people that. There's a uh, <clears throat> there's a, a wage comparison, actually, uh, that I've done back in June. This is not too long ago uh, for the Tampa mm -hmm. market. And I've noticed that there were, uh, there were prom uh, plumbing companies out there hiring young folks right off you know, the school gate. And they could make in a year more than a service manager, experienced services, service manager makes at a, 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 a multifamily property. So mm -hmm. I'm repeating, a guy right out of high school, a company, plumbing company hires them to teach them the trade and they get paid. They, they could take more money home than an experienced service manager in a multifamily yep. industry. How can we realistically think that we're going to keep our existing talent or bring new talent into the industry yep. when we're so far behind? Um, yeah. You, Adrian, you can't pay an, a, an experienced maintenance supervisor. You can't pay them enough. I, I don't think I'm, I, I, and I'm almost mean that literally. Um, you know, we talked about compensation, and, and certainly if you're talking to a candidate out there, somebody brand new that wants to come in and work for you, you, you need to have a competitive package. But in doing that, you can't ignore the facts, the, the fact of the people that you already have on, on payroll. You've got to look at their compensation, and you've got to adjust accordingly. When that experienced maintenance supervisor finds out that a brand new maintenance tech has just come, been hired and been paid a $10,000 signing bonus and is making more than they are, Guess what? Guess what's going to happen with the maintenance supervisor? They're gone. You've just lost them. So you, you can't forget your existing employees. And I think a lot of folks do that. Uh, they try to get competitive on what they're offering to new hires, but but you can't forget your existing people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, there was a question on, a, uh, on one of the groups, on a, uh, Facebook groups. I think it was on multifamily insiders uh, or multifamily share space literally two days ago, and someone was asking, what would you prefer? You know, uh, should should we pay uh, bonuses, extra bonuses to the new hires, like hiring bonuses, or should we pay mm -hmm. the existing em uh, employees? And in my personal opinion, I think we should do both. 
it's not one or the other. It's all of them. No. You, 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 you should. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's not an either or situation. We're not doing either this or that. We have to do both. And actually, this way, we keep our current employees in place and we're bringing mm -hmm. new talent in this way. It, it's not like we either do new hire bonuses or stay bonuses, okay. whatever you call them. Um, yeah, I agree 100% with that. You, you have to do both. Um, you, you need all those people. You can't have you can't have somebody on site working there with vacant positions. I mean, they're going to get stressed. It's like a snowball going downhill. If they're stressed and they get beyond their limit, they're going to leave too. So it, it's at some point you have to bite the bullet and understand that in this market today, it's going to cost you a heck of a lot more to staff these properties and do the right things in, in terms of compensation packages. But, but, you know, at the end, the other thing that strikes me about this, though, Adrian, is that there is a point at which compensation becomes too expensive for the operator, where they say, you know, it just I, I understand I have to I need to pay this person this much money. But at some point they might say, you know, I, I can't afford it, can't do it. So, I, you know, I think over the past couple of years, we I think you and I talked about this some when I saw you last down in Tampa, but it's. The strategies for how you staff a property, how many people you put in maintenance, how many people you have in the office or et cetera, uh, those things are starting to change. And, um, you know, so so folks are looking at things like maybe going with contractors to help out, you know, outside contractors to help out with uh, maintenance as opposed to having the folks on staff thinking that maybe that will come in at, at a cheaper rate. And I, I don't know what the pricing on that is right now, to be honest with you. So I'm not sure how that how that all tabulates out. But but it's definitely something that people are starting to look at. And so they're going to change the way they look at staffing these properties. And that will in turn change the way they end up compensating whatever employees they do have left over. I totally agree with you. Uh, I, I do see the trend myself for full disclosure, right? I work currently work for a company that offers maintenance services and my company service uh, services, single family, multifamily institutional owners. They're actually, considering paying, you know, outsourcing some of their maintenance work versus, you know, for various reasons, you know, one of the, I guess the main reason is that, you know, they're sure stuff. They don't have enough stuff mm -hmm. to, uh, to cover the needs that they have. But then I think, you know, this is a very good, you know, valid point. It comes to a point where it's not worth paying. What people don't understand is that we're not just paying a wage, an hourly wage. You know, there's insurance, there's tax burdens, there, mm -hmm. you know, so much liability and so much overhead to oversee that person. And when it all comes up to, you know, a certain number, you might just be better off to just say, okay, we're just going to pay a contractor instead, you know, mm -hmm. contract out of work. And we don't have to have all this overhead. We don't. We don't have all this, you know, extra taxes that we got to pay. So at the end of the day, we're, we're probably breaking even with less stress because we're going to, you know, we, we're going to contract things out. So, yeah, I, I see that happening. I think that the industry is really searching, like uh, they're deeply searching a lot of companies for the best answers, yeah. which way to go. I don't think it's going to be, again, here uh, either or, like we're not hiring maintenance anymore and we contract everything out, or we're building a huge maintenance uh, compartment and we're going to handle everything in-house. I think it's just going to be a combination of both, and the percentages will vary between companies. But definitely, the trend that I'm seeing is more from uh, just doing more in-house, doing less, and outsourcing uh, more services. Uh, yeah, I think, I think you know, I've also heard, like you said, people are trying a lot of different things. They're experimenting, trying to find the answers. That to, to solve the problem. And they've also I've heard people talking about uh, reduced working hours, flexible working hours, uh, shorter work weeks. Uh, you know, maybe you work two days in a row, then you get two off then you work another two days, you know, all kind of different variations on a theme. I don't know that anybody has any real answers yet, but uh, I've heard a lot of different a lot of different people, different companies trying these different options out to see what might work best for them. And, you know, at the end of the day, this is not the first time this has happened. Um, the pandemic has obviously caused a lot of these issues and problems for us and pushed us down this road. In the past, there have been a lot of big companies that have tried different solutions, to, especially in the area of maintenance. I know for a fact, I remember in the late 1990s, and I don't think anybody at Equity Residential would mind me saying this, but um, Equity tried, had a lot of properties in the Orlando area, Central Florida. 
And so what they did was, is they basically took the maintenance people off of the properties and created a central maintenance hub, if you will. And then work orders would come into that hub and, and they would be, uh, you know, maintenance techs would be dispersed out into the field to go to wherever they needed to go that day to fix whatever problems they had. It didn't work very well. <laughs> so they, they disbanded that. That was, but there was an attempt. And there's been other companies that have tried very similar kind of, of things to do to try to save a few bucks in terms of the operating cost, the payroll cost for a property. Um, so I, I couldn't agree with you more, though. It, it, people are trying all kinds of different things. Some of these things are going to work. Some of them are not going to work. But I'll tell you one thing. I don't think this is a situation where we're going to go back to the way it was before the pandemic. I think people could come up with new solutions for these issues, such as staffing and compensation and what have you. And th these, these are going to become the new norm as far as multifamily is concerned. We're going to have a different way of looking at the way we run these properties and staff the properties and pay the people to do the work. I want to make a prediction here. And, and this is not just because I'm, you know, I'm such a smart, intelligent person, but I've seen it in history, in, in real life in general. Yeah. Uh, we will have those companies that will try, like you said, new things. Some of them will succeed and some of them will fail. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not going to be 100% fail proof just because you tried it. Okay. Right. But those that are going to find the solutions that are successful, they're going to attract the most talent because they're going to be at the avant garde of the industry. And everybody, most talent is going to go and follow that model. By the yep. time everybody else is going to realize, oh, wait a second, this is working, you know, we could implement it too. They're yeah. going to be late in a the game. Uh, they might have some benefits, but then they will get mostly B and C players because the A players are already gone with the guy that started first. Uh, what yep. do you think about this theory? No, I think there's a lot to that. I, I, I think you're probably right. There's always winners and losers really in every game, right? And that's what we're talking about. So you're going to see a lot of stuff tried and a lot of stuff fail. A lot, some stuff might work. I don't know, but it's uh, it, it'll be an interesting, interesting game. No question about it. I guess all I'm trying to say really here is that don't think that doing nothing is going to solve any type of problem. No, you know, it, it puts you way behind. Try yep. just just do something, anything, and try, try, try until you find what works for you. Because you know every company is different, though. Even though everybody manages real estate, you know they're structured differently. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> their financials are differently. You know there's a difference between owner manage, you know a REIT, a third party management. There's just so uh, many different moving parts. So each yep. one of them uh, looks at their investment in a different way. You know shorter, mid term, or longer term. For sure. But there's, there's no question, though, what you're right in what you're saying about if you don't do anything, you, you're, you're falling behind. You've got you've got to at least try something, whatever it may be. And it may, like I said, it may work, it may not work. But at the end of the day, trying it is better than doing nothing. Yeah. Uh, I know that your company is making a huge impact out there and it's going to make a bigger impact once more companies, more uh, executives realize that, hey, look, there's something in this employee feedback like there's our people know better than we do really yeah like you don't have to invent you don't have to write all the policies to give all the direction all you really have to do is to ask your people in a field people that mm -hmm. operate and implement best practices you know yep. take take your winners from the field ask them how they do it and replicate that it's modeling the masters it's not a new thing it's not a new thing at all no just take it's that not. and replicate it uh what we're mainly doing in an industry you know for years i've been seeing this we spend most of our resources in a travel assets that's where we spend most of the time trying to get this asset to stay afloat and by the time we get it afloat and we move to the next one that's trouble the first trouble one is going to start going back down because you know we <laughs> help them but we did it yep. We didn't actually come up with a better system to handle so they don't go back down. So that's why I'm saying look for the best talent, replicate whatever they do best, because that is in your best interest. And also, opinions are very important. So that's where a company like yours, Swift Bunny, comes into place in a, in a big way, comes into play, because this is invaluable uh, information. And people are willing to give it to you for free. Yeah. 
There why are, not just why not just take advantage? You know, there there are things though that you have to do. Uh, for example, confidentiality is pretty important. So if you you have to give the respondent to the when you ask these questions, you have to give them the option of being anonymous. You just do. Um, if you don't, your response rate goes way down. You don't get near nearly as good of information as if they were anonymous. And and it's amazing to me just having been an executive on the management side in my past, it, it's amazing to me though, how, how different the employee's opinion of something might be from the C-suites or the executive team's opinion, executive team members that get together all the time and talk about, we're doing this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to change this, whatever. And uh, they think they're doing the good thing. They think it's the right thing. They think it's going to have a positive impact in the field with the employees but then you go and you talk to the employees and they're like, what the hell? This is not right. I mean, you, you get all kind of opinions about this and it's not the same as executive teams. And, and if, uh, if you don't ask the employees, they're never going to tell you. But if you do ask, believe me, they'll be happy to tell you. They'll, they'll, they'll give you more information than you probably want to see. A hundred percent, Joe, a hundred percent. The answers are out there. You know, you just have to ask and also listen and consider like do yeah. something about it. Like I said, don't don't just ask for feedback and then put it in your drawer and say, well, we ask for feedback and then you don't do anything about it. You about don't it, right. provide something back to say, hey, you know, thank you for the feedback. We consider we might implement something. We think it's a terrific idea and we'll implement everything where, man, like this is never going to work. You know, just something, just tell people something just so they see that when they take the time to give you the feedback, you took the time to read it. And you act yep. upon the feedback. Whatever the answer is, I, I think people are good just to hear that you you actually care, like you actually did something with the feedback. Well, that that is what you just said. So just say you surveyed your people and found out that there was a problem with maybe the health insurance program. The I don't know the the copays were too high. What whatever. And so you take that feedback and you make a change. You go in and you rebid out your, your insurance program. You make this change. You know, one thing that the executive teams are pretty poor at doing is once they they can do what, everything I just said up to that point. But once once it's been done, you need to go out there and market what you just did back to the people out there in the field and say, hey, we, we heard what you said. You didn't like this. You didn't like that. And we made these changes. Here are the changes. Da, 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 please, do. What, what, what do you think? And then get another survey to find out, did they really, in fact, like it? And, and make sure that, that the effect you're trying to go for, the impact you're trying to go for, is actually what happened with your employees. That's important. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. <clears throat> Joe, the last part of our, our conversation, I want to fire some rapid questions at you. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> The first one is your readings. You know, what do you read? What what is, what is that you're reading that is good? You know, uh, fiction, nonfiction, professional books. What would you recommend? I'm I I am a fiction fan. I love fiction, and uh, my favorite author is Clive Cussler. He has a Dirt Pit series of adventures, and I love reading those things. I'm I uh, I'm huge on that. I you know. Kara Rice run, and, and Jen Picotti with Swift Bunny, they run a book club and have a lot of folks around the country in the industry that, that join in on that. And they talk about different things they've read, what have you. And a lot of the stuff they read is just too highbrow for me. I can't, I can't get in there and get much out of it. I like the fun stuff. So I, Clive Custler, that's my favorite author right there. <clears throat> Joe, what piece of advice or a few pieces of advice would you have for a young person right out of high school, right out of school, ready to enter the real world? Uh, manage your expectations. Uh, don't go out there thinking you're just going to change the world in the first week and that uh, everything's going to come up roses. It always does. Uh, the real key is, is perseverance and being able to come back from, you know, not getting or not having the things happen that you really wanted to have happen. Um, you know, if you keep plugging at it, if you keep beating your head against that wall, eventually it's going to come down. But you, you've got to you got to have that perseverance. And I think a lot I think a lot of kids come out of school these days and just think that, uh, you know, things are just going to work out. Just no problem at all. I I've, I used to teach a class, Adrian, at uh, University of Georgia on real estate technology. And 
we, uh, myself and the professor, the, the tenure professor there at the school that I worked with, we, uh, we always used it as an opportunity to also talk to them about the apartment business in general as a great career opportunity. And I remember giving a speech one year up there and uh, I, I finished talking about how great the industry was, and how much opportunity there was, advancement, and all kind of cool things. And uh, it was a Q&A, a little Q&A period at the end there. And this, this young young girl stands up and she's a junior in the, in the school there in junior year and she says to me she says mr bailey she says i worked as a part-time leasing agent last summer at a post property there in atlanta georgia she said i it was some really good experience how 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 much quick more quickly do you think that will help me in getting to become a vice president of the company and, and i was like well i don't know I can't i can't answer that but it was uh I, I mean, she, she was being honest. She had a very high expectations of what would happen when she got out in the real world. And I, I just think that, that today, managing those expectations, understanding, you know, what the re- So uh, we had a quick uh, we had a quick technical issue. We're back <laughs> online right now, and I have the next question for Joe. Uh, Joe, in the last uh, three to five years, what uh, new belief, behavior, or habit has most improved your life? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm getting up earlier in the morning these days. I used to kind of, I used to, and that was never a morning part, so I slept in. I started getting up early and started working out. So got serious about trying to uh, to lose weight and trying to get more healthy. You lose your health, you don't have anything. And uh, I've gone through some tough struggles. I had, a, I had a stroke back in 2012 and I've had some knee operations and all kinds of things. So I'm really trying to pay more attention to my body, trying to be more, more conscious of that. <clears throat> Joe, how did a failure or apparent failure set you up for future success? I, you know, I've been pretty lucky. I, I had, um, it's funny when I was, before I went to work at Maryland, I was running rooms operations at a resort down on Isla Palms, South Carolina, just outside of Charleston. It's called Wild Dunes. And uh, it was 1989, September the 21st. I remember the day. It was 11 o'clock at night, and Hurricane Hugo came into Charleston. We had in, we had evacuated uh, about, well, probably 11, 10 or 11,000 people off the resort the night before. Uh, the governor told us we had to do that. So I, I went back down to Charleston the day after the hurricane with my wife. We, we got back down there, and the resort was a disaster. It was just horrible. Um, you know, it was um, – you couldn't have rented anything to anybody. <laughs> at the time. And, uh, you know, I was, I was, I was on welfare. I was, I was taking FEMA checks at the time from the United States government. And, uh, I had the opportunity to go to work with Mary land. I found out I made those, made those, uh, did the interviews and all that and got a job there. And, uh, you know, I, I, I realized that, you know, stuff doesn't stay the same all the time that change happens. Now that's all there is to it. We, we've gone through this pandemic. That was a heck of a change for all of us. And, you know, like I said, if you if you really care about what you're doing, if you really want to put the effort into it, you'll be fine. But you got to persevere at it. I mean, just because the hurricane hit, I lost my job. I had 350 people I had to let go the same day as I lost my job. And, you know, I was kind of down in the dumps when that happened. I was like, my gosh, what happens next? And it's just that matter of being, you know, having perseverance and going out there and, and doing the best you can. Joe, when you feel stressed out, overwhelmed, uh, what type of technique or what do you do to get back in a game? Uh, I usually take a little time off. <laughs> you know, you got to recharge the batteries every once in a while. You know, sometimes you, you work at something and you're so close to it that you can't, you really have a hard time seeing the forest for the trees. And I, I always felt like sometimes when I, when I got to feel that way, like I was just up against the wall and I wasn't making any more progress. Things were getting slow on me. I'd, I'd just back off and try to try to get away from it for a little bit, take a couple of days off, 
from work um, or, or just try to mentally move that thing aside for, for a period of time and then come back to it. If, if you're working on something and nothing's happening, uh, what do they say the definition of insanity is? Doing the same thing over and over and over and, and, and hoping to get a different result. And so it, it, it does help sometimes just to back off and kind of re- reset. And I, I, that's a big thing to me. I, I try to make, when I get into that situation, that's exactly what I do. You build the biggest, the largest education platform that services the uh, the apartment, the multifamily industry. Uh, really quick, how do you see the future of training, Joe? Well, back in the day when we started Graysell, uh, people took courses because they were told they needed to take courses. Uh, you know, you, I hired you as a brand new maintenance technician. Well, by gosh, you need to take fair housing. You need to take customer service. You know, you need to understand all the stuff the folks in the office do. So I, I, I felt that way because I just felt that way. Tra- the, what's happened to training is that training has gone from that kind of a mindset to now there needs to be a reason to train. And it's not just because another year has gone by. And we want to make sure you, your fair housing knowledge is up to date. There needs to be a reason to train. You, you need to, to analyze people's performance, understand what they're doing well, what they're not doing so well, then train accordingly. And then measure them again later and then go back and retrain if necessary. So it's it's a matter of, of, of defining why the training is necessary um, and, and, and measuring performance and tying those two things together, the measurement of the performance and the actual taking of whatever training is necessary. That's big, the big, big difference over the past few years. Yeah, I love the fact that you brought, you know, in other words, KPIs, measuring the effectiveness of training, not just do it for the sake of it and just say that we have this amazing program, but measure how this improved the performance or, you know, and enhanced the, the life of your employees, not just say that we, we just did yep. this, we, we checked the box. Some other things that have changed, Adrian, too, is that training has become uh, it's become shorter. Uh, back in the day, when we create a class on any topic you want to name, there were so many different subtopics that need to be covered for for us to consider that somebody had been fully trained on something, whatever it was. Now they're taking those little subtopics and breaking those out as smaller smaller pieces. So now instead of taking one course, you're taking 30 courses, but they're much shorter to accomplish the same thing. That's That's been something that's been a big deal. Uh, gamification of training is something that's big. Um, you know, you can make training a game, et cetera. Uh, a lot of things like that. It, it's, it's evolved. There's no question about it. It's evolved a lot over the past 20 some odd years since we started. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, the, the tracking, the, the learning management system side of the coin, that's, that has pretty much stayed the same. They look a little different than they used to, but th- that part of it really hadn't changed that much. The content is really where the, the rubber meets the road, and, and that, that's where the big changes have come. Joe, it was a real pleasure to have you on. I truly enjoyed the conversation here. Uh, I do want to give you the opportunity in closing to maybe – speak about something you wish we would have uh, covered and we didn't or you know answer a question that i didn't ask and also uh to feel free i want you to feel free to share some of your contact information if uh, some of the uh, some of our viewers you know wanted to reach out to you where could they find you well i'll start out with the easy one first contact information is just real simple it's joe j-o-e at swiftbunny.com uh you can reach me there any time of the day I'd be happy to love to hear from you. Love to love to offer you whatever help I can. Um, you know, probably the one thing we, 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 we touched on this a little bit, but, but the one thing I think that that's really critical to us is that as an industry, we're going through so much change right now in terms of our policies, procedures, hiring practices, compensation, you name it. it it's, it's all kind of up in the air and Lord knows our industry doesn't like change. I mean, I know a lot, I know nobody really likes change that much, but I think multifamily detests change uh, more so than (laughs) any other group I've ever run across. Um, You know, we will get through this. It it will happen. Things might look a little different on the other side. We're not quite there yet, obviously, but like I say, things might look a little bit different, but we will get there. And uh, the thing that really makes a difference in multifamily to me 
is the character of the people that, that work in this business. They're some of the best people you will ever meet anywhere in your life, right work right here in multifamily. And it's, it's a pleasure to be in this industry. It's a joy to be in this industry. And at the end of the day, the thing that's going to get us through is each other. I, I, I couldn't uh, I couldn't think of a better closing, a way to close. And I wholeheartedly uh, share this feeling with you that you know, we have some amazing people. And I ran into a lot of them. I, I am a very fortunate person to run into a lot of them. And I try to get them, every single one of them on, on the podcast right here, just so they could, you know, share some success stories, some some wisdom, even some failure is nothing wrong with sharing failure because life, life is not just about successes. In order to That's right. become successful, you got to fail a lot and you will fail a lot no matter what. <laughs> uh, and I, I want them to share because I think... Uh, it's the uh, only walk path for you know younger generations, for those that come from behind, for those that want to move up into their uh, you know in, into their profession to have uh, these uh, leaders of the industry. They're sharing the wisdom and just kind of learning, so they don't have to learn everything the hard way. So, uh, Joe, again, thank you very much. I so much appreciate you uh, taking the time to come and meet with me right here, and uh, it was a great conversation. I hope to get you back here uh, soon. Maybe we can talk about uh, more, more stuff because, you know, like you said, this is an ever-changing world and the industry makes no exception. Even though there's resistance to change, there's a lot of change out there and, you know, there's a lot of things changing. And in a position like yours is very important because you're the ones that experience, like, sees this change firsthand through, uh, through employee uh, feedback. So, It'll be very interesting to do a, a part two a few months down the road to see how things have evolved since. Adrian, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. I'd love to do it again. Everybody, thank you very much for watching. This is Multifamily Chronicles, and I'm your host, Adrian Danila. Hope to see you back here soon. Have a great day.